Okay, everyone, it gives me a great pleasure um, to welcome Jay Chapman here. Fantastic to have him here. Um, I'm going to run through, uh, I know you all know a lot about him, but I'm going to run through some of his uh, um, key moments as an artist. Um, um, interestingly, uh, we start off with an early rejection from the slave. Uh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. And Chelsea. And Chelsea. Yeah. Yeah. He went to North East London College and um, he then uh, went to the Royal College of Art and um, well, he graduated in 1990. Um, he started collaborating with Dinos, his brother, and they were assistant in, in 91. But they were also, while they were at the Royal College, they were assistant to Gilbert and George. Um, he participated in a lot of shows, which I'll go through, including Sensation, where, um, and um, one of the, um, and he made a number of um, things, and was nominated for the Turner Prize in 2003. Um, his famous piece, or their famous piece, Hell, which they made in 2000, was burnt in the famous Saatchi Fan. I remember that piece, it's quite astonishing. Some of the key exhibitions um, since 19, I mean, he's been showing Reddy since 1990, and um, White Cube, he's um, part of the White Cube Gallery. Um, he showed, uh, it was nominated for the Turner Prize in 2003. He showed at Tate Liverpool in 2006, um, in the Hermitage Museum in Russia in 2012. Um, in Seoul in 2013, and uh, at the Serpentine Gallery in 2013-14. And um, it's, he's been really active in defending the arts through letters and charities, and um, oh, he was also in the Bad Art for Bad People at Tate Liverpool. Well, so anyway, very much, very big wealth. He's gonna show, I, I'm gonna say another thing, He's going to show some films, and then he's going to be opening open to questions. And um, we don't actually have a microphone to move around the audience, so you're going to have to talk very loudly when you ask him a question. He has a microphone, but can you try and speak really loudly? Um, okay, Jay, welcome. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I, we're just going to show. I'm going to show a couple of films. One is. Uh, called Sacrificial Mutilations and Death in Modern Art, which is a very old film. Um, and the second one is a, a, an episode two from a mini series that I, I just shot for Sky Arts. I'm not sure if anyone's seen it. It's, it's, it's a 20-minute it's a, it's a twenty minute second episode. Um, and then I guess the thing is that it, hopefully it will uh, summon some kind of questions from you and then I'll answer them. So, shall we? It's very much open to you all to ask questions, but I've got just a couple of questions. Sure. One is, if you could say something about when you make these films, um, you and Dinos work together, yeah. how that dynamic works, and also, yeah. um, because it, you obviously agree about a lot, yeah. and it's very interesting to hear that, because uh, quite a lot of people do work um, together here. Um, um, the other question I want to know is quite a lot of your work has involved kind of bodily distortions, which yep. I find very interesting. I wonder if you could say something about that. Sure, okay. Is this working? Yes, it is working now. Um, it's not working now, is it? Is it working now? Yeah. Can you hear at the back? Okay, cool. Um, uh, yeah, working together. I, um, I think um, when we... When we uh, left Royal College, I think, in 1990. I think we, we uh, my brother had already worked for Gilbert and George for about seven years as their assistant, and I got a job there. We worked for another year before um, we got fired, because uh, <laughs> I asked for a pay rise. Um, what was interesting about watching them work was that they, they as, a, as, a, as, a, as two people who make uh, one body of work, they operate uh, very, very symbiotically, so that they, they, uh, they, they work as though you know they they are a kind of absolutely integrated. There's no um, there's no um, divergence from the idea. There's no um, argumentation. Um, but I think what we learned from that was that you know the idea of working together didn't mean to say that we had to agree. That the the, the, the discourse that the, the if the work 
originated from discourse um, or from conversation. We, it would be better if the if, if the conversation was, was at least uh, um, critically orientated or at least kind of you know argumentative. Um, so um, having so, so so having said that, there's no kind of methodology for how we work. Um, um, I mean, Dean always says that it's the first person in the studio that <coughs> gets to, to make the work they want to make. So, um, um, and also thinking about these films, I mean, I directed these films, he did some of the music on them, but the film comes from uh, a novel that I wrote about 10, 15 years ago. So we have separate activities which don't include each other. Uh, Dean makes music, and uh, I, like I said, I, said I write. Um, uh, what's the second question? The second was about um, your, your quite often your work features some kind of bodily distortion sure. about bodiliness as well. Yeah. If you could say something about that. Sure. Um, well, I suppose that you're kind of referring to some of the, uh, the, the Siamese twin sculptures, the mannequin sculptures. Um, and even the head here. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, quite a lot of... That's true. The, the big head. The great big head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose you know. I mean, Tom at Mandragoras is the is the epitome of the kind of ar aristocratic, uh, uh, you know, the the the, an the anemic aristocrat who lives on top of the volcano, um, you know. And I suppose that, <laughs> you know, the idea that I mean, I, sp I suppose the idea of bod bodily distortion is, uh, you know, we're interested in the idea of of what how things are idealized. So uh, one of the uh, uh, objections to some of the work we made before that was the, the Siamese twin pieces was that they were, they were referred to as being, as, as being uh, deformations, as being things which were uh, aberrations or things that even, you know, it's ridiculously um, uh, explained as, 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 as perversity or, you know, something which, uh, an index of, of child abuse or, or, or and I think the thing is, is that what we're interested in is the notion of saying that if you produce a sculpture which has no referent in the world other than itself, then it can't be an aberration. It's a perfection of itself. Uh, so I think that, you know, in a sense, um, it's not so much uh, uh, an interest in aberration, but it's an interest in, in what stands as being an aberration. Um, I think also, you know, that we, the first sculpture we made that was, in a sense, um, it was the, 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 the child mannequin with the penis for the nose and the title of the work was Fuckface. Um, the origin of that was we were trying to think, you know, and I think this is maybe a kind of a, a core issue or a core struggle in our work, is how, how do you produce a work of art which can't be redeemed? How do you produce a work of art which can't be reappropriated to the logic of, of positivity? What I mean by that is to say that, you know, you could, ha you could produce a painting or a sculpture which depicts something of... Of, uh, abhor abhorrent of uh, some kind of terrible act of violence and there's always a way in which it can be recuperated to some kind of use value some positive use value in the sense that all, all, you know, all bad things get uh, uh, transformed through the prism of, of ethics into good things so we were thinking if you made a sculpture well how would you make a sculpture that could not be uh, uh, appropriated to that logic and uh, so we kind of thought well fuck face is uh, a kind of a, a really interesting word because it's you know there's no way you could there's no way you could kind of appropriate that to some kind of you know some message about the positivity of the world so you know and I, and I suppose in a way that we were trying you know a lot of our work is is about trying to um, avoid the, the the noose of uh, uh, of a certain kind of uh, Christian inheritance <coughs> in a sense the notion that you know you know the idea of, of um, Something which depicts something violent can always be turned into something positive. That's you know, okay, going in circles. So, um, little mannequin called Fuckface was born, um, and I think that in, in some ways it kind of it's it kind of it it began a sequence of works that then became more and more outrageous by title. Um, so it's, uh, I think Fuckface uh, led to Two Face Cunt, which was essentially. Uh, a mannequin with two heads and a vagina between the two faces. I mean, the idea of if what, what we were trying, to, what we were interested in doing, was trying to produce works of art which had any zero autobiography and zero cultural content. There was no way in which you could look at that thing and, and extract some kind of uh, uh, ideal. Ver it, that the work of art would not edify the viewer. That the viewer would see this thing and learn nothing from it. And that, that in a sense, it's 
meaning was as superficial as its surface. Um, I suppose at that time we were kind of at least influenced by people like Jeff Koons, the, the New York Now show was, was at the Saatchi Gallery, um, you know, so when you saw those, uh, I mean this is very early days of Jeff Koons, you know, seeing these uh, shiny sculptures where, you know, there was no point of <coughs> human contact with these things because the, the surfaces simply reflected everything around them, so in that sense they were devoid of contact, uh, content. And, um, you know, I suppose, yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Is the reason you had stereotypes in that film as yeah. another example of having work that can't be redeemed? Is there another reason? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, it's, I think, I think there's the, the, the idea of, you know, reducing things to kind of generic, uh, uh, sort of, you know, kind of a, a very, you know, that if you want to make a happy painting, it's a smiley face. If you want to make something horrible, then it's a swastika. You know that you start to use these impoverished terms to actually kind of elicit sort of complex. I mean, it's very interesting to see that you can make a sculpture like Hell that has thousands and thousands of little tiny toy soldiers doing awful things to each other, and you can actually somehow extort compassion from people. That people will look at that thing, especially when you show it in Germany. Um, that they, you know, people can get upset by you know. These, these little, you know, they're, they're people will have compassionate associations with things which don't deserve that level of human input, you know. So I think that's, we're kind of very interested in the idea of how, uh, you know, you can, you know, you can kind of get people to have empathetic responses to things that don't deserve it. Is there anything that upsets you then? Um, in what way? Yeah. Um, trying to think. Well, I, I mean, I just, I, mean, I suppose, in a sense, you know, you know, the, the kind of, it would be like saying that, you know, if you drew a, a stick person with a dagger sticking out of its head, you know, in terms of how that would cause uh, an expression, ex an, a, 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 an, an expression of anxiety on a viewer. Would be an index of their psychosis. So, so if what we're trying to do, what we're interested in, is trying to say, well, what's the, you know, how do, how do you get humans to think about stuff? How do you get people to have, you know, sentimental feelings about things which are kind of like slightly, you know, how do you get people to connect with things which are, uh, are, you know, inappropriately empty, you know, so so that, and it's and it, and it just is in, it's just quite it's I suppose, in a way, it's. Um, it's a way of, of, of trying to, uh, <coughs> uh, trying to sort of, I don't know, define the, 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 the points at which human, human notions of expression are kind of mediated by the most, you know, moronic terms, you know, to be upset by a, a load of 30,000 30, soldiers doing horrible things to each other is to kind of, is to, is, is to, is to, is to somehow, um, provoke a magnitude of, ex of expression which is undeserved of the material you know and I guess that that's the you know the question of this is, is you know the, the how do you ha what does a work of art do how does it function how do, how do you get someone to have a reaction to something which is you know is, is, a, is, is a work does a work of art can a work of art communicate and how does it communicate Mandrigal. Can you speak very loud so Sorry. people yeah. can hear your question? So the guy with the big head yes. in the film um, had kind of this passing resemblance to a Vic Reeves character of right. Lloyd Grossman. Right. From oh, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you remember that? Yeah. Um, and so I guess uh, I'm getting towards how does humour um, kind of play on in your work and what kind of influences you have? Yeah. Um, well, I think, yeah, I think it's, I think humour... Uh, you know, opens up a kind of a schism between you know thought and it, and it, and its 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 uh, you know it, it, it 
there's a point at which kind of the moral framework work where you identify what you think and how you, how you, how you think you should think. It, it opens a schism between the two things. Um, and, you know, it's the, it's the point at which um, language fails, collapses, falls apart. Um, and it's a kind of, you know, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's also a point at which the unconscious uh, makes itself present, you know. So yeah, humor is very important. In <coughs> very serious about humor. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. Inherently positive. Well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It, yes, it is. It's kind of, you know, and also it's a way of it, it. kind of makes a compensation for things which are horrific. You know, I mean, there's you know, there's the what's it the, the idea of it's a kind of yeah, it's a kind of a, a, a visceral reaction to something which is uncomfortable. But I don't know if that's necessarily redemptive. It might be just a kind of a, a, an open-ended expression. It doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily recuperate some kind of moral worth by laughing at something, and in a sense, the idea of laughing at inappropriate things defines defines humour. You know, it's an inappropriate reaction. You know, if you laugh at a dead person or a picture of something that's awful, it's a kind of it's the point of, the point at which your reaction has, has become abstract, rather than defined by a, uh, by a, 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 a reasonable outcome. It's an unreasonable response to something which is. But isn't the Lithuanian culture like the toy soldiers? Yeah. Like, act like they were funny. Yeah. But because they're toy soldiers, I mean, isn't that sort of an appropriate reaction? As it isn't, or is it more? Oh, maybe I'm just like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think I mean I suppose that you know the the idea of what humor does, it, it, you know, it's it's an interesting thing about. The kind of you know the the, the, the moral parameters of hu of humour you know to tell you know the idea of telling a, 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 a horrific joke, a racist sexist horrific joke doesn't mean to say that the person who tells the joke is racist or sexist or you know so that what so the idea of laughing at something which is uh, which is transgressive shows that humour doesn't serve moral purposes you know. And then so, so what happens when, you know, the idea of, you know, that, that if you have someone who tells a very uh, uh, um, challenging joke, it's only, you know, if you say, right, what, you know, what's, which is the funniest, funniest joke, but what's funny, uh, uh, why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? It's not that funny. Uh, but if, you know, why did the chicken kill itself to get to the other side? You know, it's a bit funnier. But or, or <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's great about fucking 28-year-olds. There's 20 of them. <laughs> you know, that's a bit more funny. But it's only funny because it's horrible. You know? And, they, and so the increments of whether how something is funny veers towards the inappropriate. <coughs> I should go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I know you said like the but like, is it, it, that must be a very hard place to be in, and like, how, how you work from, from there? From, from where? Sorry? You know, you're saying like, you're trying to make something which, you know, like, it's not abhorrent, it's just like, there's only one thing yeah. in it, yeah. having like absolutely no yeah. context other than what yeah. things you're making. Like, can, you, can you all hear that? No. Can you stand up and be the same? Oh, no, that's cool. <laughs> I don't understand why no context. I think you were saying like you were trying to content. Oh, content. Yeah, not content. Content. Yeah. Um, well, I think you know, you know, we made a we made a um, a sculpture of, of Stephen Hawking on a big rock, um, and just the notion that you know that that you know in, in in a way there was no context given to the sculpture other than the fact that it, it was a kind of a, a a kind of almost hyper-realistic 
sculpture of this person in a, in a wheelchair stuck on this rock. Um, and the thing about the notion of employing the means of portraiture to someone who has a, an imperfect body, in a sense, uh, provoked a reaction that was, that was the assumption that it was an inappropriate subject for portraiture. <coughs> you know, without anything that we had said, or obviously given the context of our work, it was probably a good guess that that was the aim. But what's interesting about it was the notion of saying, you know, that if portraiture in itself as a, a, as a representational form has uh, a presumption that the object, that the subject of it should be ideal, you know, that the idea of actually then making a sculpture without any kind of defamation of them, you know, kind of hyper-realist sculpture, that actually that intrinsically within the representational means that we employed, that it, it, it somehow... Uh, 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 fall short of what the <coughs> expectation of the representational mode required. You know, the portraiture, <coughs> portraiture is, 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 it has a presuppositional idealism to it, you know. And so I guess this is one of the things that we're interested in in, 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 in producing work is that, you know, what do, 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 is, a, is a work of art something about, does it, does it edify the world? Do, is it a necessary condition, a precondition of a work of art to say something better about the world than the world had before it was there, you know? And I suppose that what we're interested, you know, so that, because I suppose in a sense what we're kind of interested in is the idea that if you extrapolate, you know, the notion of aesthetics, beauty, sublime, you end up with a kind of a, a moral gradient, you know, going towards some idea of kind of teleological perfection, you know? So what we, what, what the, some of the questions that we're interested in is to say, what is it if you make a work of art that has no interest in positivity, no interest in, in, in edifying the viewer, no interest in presenting something in the world that where it's where it, where what it's trying to do is to, is to suggest something better, or at least you know, how do you make something which is irredeemable, that is just simply you know in some kind of uh, um, uh, culturally void way, uh, in and for itself. Following on from that, what? <laughs> Yeah. His sculpture on the flint, and he was kind of applauded for kind of doing a sculpture of the disabled. That's right. Do you think then the public thinks he is morally kind of yeah, pure, I and do. you and your brother are morally kind of corrupt? It's well, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting kind of, you know, you misheard me say content and context, but you're right. I mean, the, the, the idea of kind of, you know, it would, be, it would be ludicrously disingenuous if I kind of shuffled in a kind of a uh, uh, Stephen Hawking sculpture and sat back and went, you know, <laughs> you know, what do you think? You know, without the expectation that the context of the rest of our work, our, our work should make it quite clear that it's not, it's not straightforward, and that we're not kind of suggesting that that you know that the the, the, the representational means of of, of of sculpture should accommodate people who are supposedly you know, uh, 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 you know, not not perfect. Whereas I think what Mark Quinn is, is doing exactly that. <coughs> what he's doing is that he's kind of, he is, he's redeeming sculpture for the purposes of making it serve the purpose of something which is, so, so in a sense what he's, what, what's happening is that he's idealising people who are supposedly unideal. And that's applauded. That's applauded, yeah. So in a sense that what he's doing is that he's kind of, he's kind of reconfiguring the notion of, of, <coughs> of I idealised kind of portraiture to simply accommodate a, a, a new version of idealism, of, of, of the ideal form. What if this logic is wrong then? Sorry? What if this logic is wrong? What if art is just... Because they seem that all the, all the initial motivation is based on you trying to uh, invert this logic. So yeah. if this logic is just, just your, just your interpretation, just your version is wrong, it's, it's not intrinsically, there's no intrinsically a truth in it. it doesn't really apply to It's very difficult to discuss a work of art without discussing its kind of qualitative relation to the notion of beauty. Yeah. I mean, nobody walks into a studio and says, it's really great, it's ugly. <laughs> and so that means that there's a kind of, there are some inherent values which are, uh, are, are presuppositional. And I would say that the work of art, or at least a critical project, would be to try and undermine those values, or at least to suggest that they're, they are things which propel the work of art before the artist has even made the work. You know, if, if a work, you know, the, if the notion of, you know, aesthetic beauty or aesthetic worth is a, is, a, is, a, is a value which kind of, you know, inhabits the notion of 
of, of historical art, then you can be sure that its momentum precedes the production of the work of art that you'll make tomorrow. But it means to say that actually the terms are kind of pre-given. So that means to say that a work of art isn't, isn't that free. It means to say that that work of art has a set of values which are, are pre-attached to it before you start making it. And surely it's the job of a work of art to actually to, 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 you know, to challenge and to analyse the conditions of its production or you know, what it means, how it means. So what if the nature of this process is already abstract, even if, even if this idea is, is idealised, but the process itself is inherently abstract already? What would that be like? I think, I mean, like, for the religious art, it's, it's almost uh, has a kind of, already has, like, a tone of, like, almost like a natural illness behind all these kind of crazy motivations. I mean, what's the point of making a void? I'm confused by what you're saying. I'm just saying that this, this, this uh. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, I was wondering, I thought it was rather interesting. Earlier today, I was having a, a discussion around reference. Yeah. You mentioned that you actually don't want to have or want to reference anything, but the first film was full of references. I didn't really say I didn't want to, no, I didn't say I didn't want to reference anything. I didn't say that. Oh no! I think I think all works of art should look like other works of art. <laughs> should should work look like? I mean, I don't think I don't think you can produce a work of art that doesn't look like another work of art. It's impossible to do it. I mean, it's like you know, paint looks like paint. <laughs> you know, the work of art is already in in a process of production when you go to the shop to buy your paint. You know, that's not even just kind of linguistically, but that's just kind of you know the order of materials. So it's not, it's not possible to have things which are or are not referential. You know, any meaning that any work of art has has been delivered by the history that, pr that precedes it. So there's no way, you know, there's no way of producing work of art. I mean, I think this is also one of the, one of the interesting things about the notion of novelty in art, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the, the notion that somehow you can produce a work of art that will be the new work of art, the last work of art, the end of work of art. The, art of, the work of art that will be the end of all art because you won't need to make art anymore because you've solved the problem of art because it's so new and unlike any other art that you don't need to do anymore <laughs> and I think that's kind of that has you know there are certain kind of moments of art history where you can see that you know the high apex of moder modernity you know the flattest painting you know you know the way you can actually see that kind of uh, that kind of belief in almost the kind of the the, the, the the, 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 the solving of the problem of art. You know, it's like the end of history or the end of art, you know, or the end of philosophy. We have one last question here. Just wanted to ask a quick question about your Goya print drawing over the world. <laughs> you Spanish? No, exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't you find it disrespectful? I find it, I fi I find it completely disrespectful. Yeah, but would you, if I did it, I'm nobody, but if somebody did it, I'm your work. Well, I, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing, the, the, you know, how could someone who draws in someone else's work, someone else's work, be concerned by the notion of respect? Surely by its very nature, it's a disrespectful act. So you don't care about that whatsoever? No, I, I really care about it, but I really care that I'm being disrespectful. It's a purposeful <laughs> act. It's not a thing that I kind of I don't kind of draw on it and slap myself in the face and say, "Oh shit, what have I done?" You know, <laughs> I, I, you know it's kind of you know I know what I'm doing. Like it comes to one of your exhibitions, yeah. Smash your pieces to bits. Yeah. Throw something at it. Yeah. yeah. I've, my, I've got good. I've got a really good recommendation for you. Always draw on someone's work is dead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think on that note. Thank you very much, James. <laughs>